Welcome to ND and Me, a podcast to share NDers' lived experiences. I'm Richard, an ND coach, mentor, accountability buddy, and business consultant. Good morning, Kirsten. How are you? I am very well, thank you. Richard, very cold in um, Salisbury today, minus four outside, but... <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, um, t- tell us who you are. I am Kirsten Coftry. I am a single mum of three kids, recently diagnosed with ADHD. I'm also the founder of Gaia Learning, an online school that supports uh, neurodiverse children around the world um, and in the UK. And I've also recently launched um, an ed tech platform called Hybrid School, where we are building the technology to replicate the sort of the tech stack that we've pulled together to allow schools and communities around um, the UK to support the children in their communities because we've recognised that it's not all about um, online learning and learning in the cloud and sort of being being really excited. It's exciting being part of a global community, but that place-based um, community is really important. So, yeah, that's me. <laughs> So, 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 in my background research, <clears throat> Gaia. I, I think there's something hidden there about some need for centering and grounding and coming back to Earth. So, Absolutely. so, so, so t- t- talk to me more about all of that. Is that some base spiritualism within you? Is that some new founding? Talk to me. So, I am. Oh, I also identify as a geographer. I'm a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. It was thanks to them and uh, a scholarship that I got to retrain as a teacher, um, uh, as a secondary school geography teacher that kind of got me really on this path. And also when I was at school, just I've always been, that's the bit that's made sense to me, like the reason for education. Why, why are we, why are we learning? We're learning to figure out how we can live more sustainably on our planet that that's that is really important I ended up doing a geography degree because I didn't know what else to do and my parents said I couldn't go traveling until I got a degree so I just picked my favorite subject (laughs) and um, Gaia is an earth science hypothesis that kind of goes along the lines of if the world was to be left to its own devices that all organic and inorganic components would self-regulate and come to just uh sustain itself an equilibrium yeah yeah and i think i'm applying that to education in in my passion for the planet and uh that we're out of whack because the government politicians and exam boards have got too much control over education and we've moved on from you know factories and the need for stock standard pathways and standardized exams um i think that we need to readdress the balance by putting the power and agency back in the control of the students and the parents who are uh, key stakeholders in it and in my experience just giving students power over their learning is so transformational because they they know so much more about what they want to do and why they want to do it and um and they care massively about the planet and its future and um (laughs) yeah by telling them what to do and and all of that, our climate anxiety is increasing and and it's fundamentally important that we get that back. Now, my inorganic component in, in it is the technology and it can seem kind of counterintuitive. I think a lot of the time when people think about online learning and ed tech and, and that because we are using it at Gaia to make learning far more applicable to the real world, making it flexible so that families can spend more time with each other in nature, um, traveling, not tied to that nine to three 
school day, which makes it so impossible for working parents to be able to meaningfully do anything else. It, from my perspective, single parenting, three kids, different ages, different schools, it was absolutely impossible for me to return to any other kind of industry to be able to support all of that. And when you are even in a relationship, it sort of perpetuates that inequality because one parent has got to sacrifice th that uh, to be available at that time frame. So, I mean, we see even the students that we support coming from, I mean, we support all sorts. We, we have vulnerable kids right up to billionaire families who use our services and it's because they need that flexibility with some kids, it's because they cannot wake up until 11 a.m. With us, others, it's because they want to go in their family jet off to wherever next Tuesday. And so they don't want to be confined by um, by that structure. So, so yes, Gaia is fundamentally important and the name means a lot. And, uh, and yes, it's also Mother Earth and that female perspective that, again, I feel passionately about you're you're acting passionately too which is great to see because uh, <laughs> i have adhd and i can't like just sit on my hand <laughs> boundaries are what <laughs> no no that is fab i i, I caught a, a short of elon musk yesterday talking about the um environment um, the education process um advocating for the uh removal of you know the grade or year system so actually why don't you have a flexible approach by subject so you could have a five-year-old doing 11-year-old type work in a subject that they're passionate about um so, yeah well uh, that's you... exactly <laughs> how we've set what we set up our platform so there are you can and this thing about independent learning right if you're passionate about something you can teach yourself i loved geography i didn't really need a teacher I liked the teacher because they gave me lots of praise and I got lots of reward for that <laughs> but um maths I really needed somebody to just sit right beside me and show me over and over and over again that was not a place I could be independent yeah. um so being able to mix and match our subjects you can take the year one maths and combine it with year three music and year five art and whatever and bundle together your subjects and while we offer a very well recognized internationally regarded curriculum we were one of the first Cambridge international schools to be um, accredited online and but being able to do that at your own pace with the support of parents or or whoever is is there to help you that's the reimagining of what it could be like mm. I I am have always been interested in theme-based passion-based project-based learning but I think seeing that in a classroom situation or with my own children if you're not given uh like that safety net or the boundaries or the structure in which to sort of progress your understanding you really can get lost and feel very much at sea and as a parent watching your children sort of flounder about there is that real sense of obviously responsibility and then guilt that comes with am I preparing my child for whatever it is that they're going to be doing in the 21st century we don't even know what these jobs are going to look like but right now what we do know is employers still value GCSEs and A-levels um they value the uh, skills of critical thinking and innovation and communication. And so, yes, how can we do that and support kids in a cross-curricular way where they can, they're not bored or held back. And likewise, they're not put into situations where they become highly anxious because they're just out of their depth and having to keep up with everybody else and what's everybody doing. Cool. <clears throat> I'm just taking a big sigh of something there. Um, I love geography too. Um, my 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 year seven geography teacher 
and my GCSE geography teacher were two of the best teachers I ever had. Um, yeah. Um, you know, lear learning about volcanoes and pyroclastic flow in year seven was the coolest thing. Um, yeah. So whenever the answer was pyroclastic flow, my geography teacher would ask me what the answer was because because that I was, was enthused about exploding volcanoes because why wouldn't you be slightly amused by exploding mountains anyway um and then well i remember uh, teaching that during lockdown um in an independent school where i was working and the the traditional way of doing that was to produce your volcano model you know mm. bring it in and everyone would set their things off and um some kids would bring in cakes and whatever but generally it was that the parents had <laughs> produced these beautiful <laughs> volcanoes yeah. and stuff. but because of lockdown, that was a class that was done online. And yeah. I remember setting my year sevens the challenge of uh, creating their models in Minecraft or even on Fortnite. Or, yeah. And that was really, I mean, it, it inspired kids in another way uh, because they could show in their own gamified metaverse way their understanding of here yeah, comes the <laughs> the acid rain or the pyroclastic blows and this is why the village was here and I decided that you know these guys survived and these ones didn't and <laughs> it it just showed how creative kids could be and mm -hmm. and how yeah there's different mediums that we can show our learning in and, and, and then there's a bit for me about your comment about keeping up um through my GCSEs, I, I I started to study twelve because you know I was I was. You also scout, have ADHD, right? <laughs> a Do scout, all the things. an air cadet, ten normal GCSEs and two after school GCSEs. Um, yeah, I I didn't want to be at home, obviously. <laughs> um, so so then after a year and the trip to Venice, I dropped Italian because doing French, German, and Italian was um, hilarious. <laughs> What's the word for blanket? Is this? No, that's the Italian word for blanket. Oh, okay, I give up. <laughs> um, but I got a trip to Venice out of it, so that was well worth doing. Um, but geography was the only lesson that I had after-school detentions for to finish my coursework. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, Richard, you are more than capable of doing very well in geography. You just have to apply yourself. Deadlines are what again? Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to come into my geography class for an hour every night until you finish your homework. <laughs> like, oh. Wow. Well, um, you'll be pleased to know because now they don't do coursework anymore. It's um, exam based, which, again, can be a bit of a shame because by the time you'd gotten through all of that um, detention and stuff, you probably had something you were quite proud of. I remember my coursework being the first time I'd actually produced a really comprehensive report that had analysis and and evaluations and conclusions and well and, and then and then came to gcse day so um i, I was independent i had I had a little moped so and, and my school was you know eight or ten miles away so um <laughs> i get on my moped on the morning of gcse results day drive to the school um to the local library because they shut the school because I went to school where Ian Huntley did dastardly things to girls so we weren't allowed on campus that year because that was the year oh, wow um so we're in this little pokey library that none of us know except for if you lived in the village where the school was I think it's a town it's called a village college but it's a town <laughs> anyway um and, and and there was my biology teacher Mr Tooley Chris he was amazing um he is the reason why I can recite the balance symbol equation for photosynthesis, because at the beginning and end of every um, GCSE lesson for biology, we recited it. And now it will be ingrained in my brain until I die. Yeah. Can you um, also do osmosis is? No, oh, just, just don't. <laughs> Quadratic <laughs> equation? No. no well, These useful so, things you've used every day since. Sorry. I... Well, so, 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 so um, I did separate sciences at GCSE. So that was cool. So helping the kids now. So my eldest is doing computer science, chemistry and maths at A level. And I'm like, I can kind of get to where you're going with this because I did chemistry and maths A level. 
I flunked it, but I studied it. Um, you were there, present. Yeah. So, <laughs> I so, ran away so, so, so I turn up that morning. Mr. Tooley's like, fantastic, Richard. I'm really glad to see you. I hope you've done really, really well. I've got to be in biology. That's cool. I go and see Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans is um, a, a, a chap from Nottingham, but loves... No, he was Welsh but, and supported Wales and Nottingham in the rugby. Um, and he was, he was like, so Richard, what did you get in geography? I said, a B. I was quite pleased with my B. And he was like, oh, that's disappointing. I was like, hang on a second. So not only did I think I bust my balls and I'm quite proud of a B, you're like, well, could have done better. I'm like, that ass. <laughs> <laughs> can't you be a little bit happy that i am leaving the school with a grade that i'm kind of happy with um yeah i was quite pleased of five b's five c's and a d and the only reason i got a d in statistics is because they put me on the higher paper and i should have been on the intermediate if i was on the intermediate i probably yeah. would have got a high c um but yeah it, it's funny how 20 years later 30 years later you look back on your life and go, you know, those moments where a teacher upholds your ability mm. or questions your ability stays with you mm. forever. You know, I remember you know, my year five and six teacher um, reading aloud a story that I'd written where I'd written out the sound effects of the story. <laughs> yeah, I felt about this big. Um, oh. and, and bearing in mind that I was picked on every day from being three to 17, what I really needed was my teacher in front of 30 other kids making fun of me. Um, anyway. Um, but you're not the only one to experience and have to get over school trauma. I think it like literally for a lot of people right. is a, a getting over school. And then the idea that, well, being bullied is part of it and it's what gets us ready for life and 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 the workplace and yes the workplace can be horribly like that um but it doesn't have to be and we can reimagine it as a better kinder more inclusive more tolerant place where things like that aren't accepted and where teachers like i was saying earlier empower and give kids ownership and and when you feel like you've got control rather than being subjected to whatever, that actually what you're capable of is just, you would have recognized for yourself that you were capable of more than the B in geography because you would have known that of yourself, whereas you might not have. Well, uh, but, but again, I think there was a sense there of caring enough, you know, I, I, I've done the best in my GCSEs of everybody in my family, except for my kids. Um, and now they changed the grading structure. So I was like, I can't even compare you, you to me. don't even know what a because, nine and a one and a seven is anymore. <laughs> because you know, I, 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 I think Ethan ended up only doing nine because one of them was a B-Tech. Um, but anyway, um, and he got seven and eight. And I was like, well, that's A's and B's. Mm -hmm. So you've already done better than me because I know that seven and eights aren't four, fives and sixes, which is basically what I got. Um, but, you know, I didn't flunk school. Um, I just was too busy doing other stuff to really focus on learning. And, and that's where I fell over at A-levels. Um, so I met my now wife um, because um, I, I, I picked up, well, I did a year of aerospace engineering, then got kicked off of the course six months before, uh, six weeks before the end of year one. Because ADHD people push people's buttons. Um, and then went back um, at, to study A-levels, maths, chemistry, physics. Oh, I've got a gap in my timetable and I need 20 hours. What am I going to law? Um, so, <laughs> so my wife was doing sociology, psychology, law, and she had a gap and chose media studies. <laughs> <laughs> so um we've got this dual passion of law because we did um a dual passion of media because i like watching films and she was studying media so basically every break time that we had off together we went to the library and we watched movies and the the sixth form that we were at had two campuses one on the outskirts of cambridge one inside of cambridge 
Um, and there was a shuttle bus back then. So you could just get on a shuttle bus, go into town, and then Orange Wednesdays was a thing back then. Um, so we just went to the cinema, like, every Wednesday afternoon. Oh, wow. For two years. Um, and how did you do in media and law? <laughs> well, so I failed everything. I have an AS level in law after three years at sixth form. <laughs> oh, <brilliant. laughs> um, and my wife passed because she um, actually studied. Um <laughs> whereas yeah. you were just being distracted by her <laughs> well so, so so the third year I, I decided to like put all of my eggs in the law basket so I reset my AS and did my A2 in my third year and that's all I did um but um I was also keen to start earning money so then I started working so then I did um AS and A2 at evening school whilst working five days a week um, so I didn't improve my grade from my second year. Uh. <laughs> oh, it was bad. Uh, and then we didn't go to university because that September we fell pregnant with my son, um, oh, who's yeah. now mm -hmm. 16 and a half and studying oh, further maths in his spare time at A-level because four A-levels is what you should be doing. <laughs> you yeah. don't have any ADHD traits, do you? No, well, you yeah, maybe. Um, Although, you know, the reason why we do so many GCSEs isn't because we need so many GCSEs. It's it's an economic thing for the schools and the exam boards and the amount of money that they get for students doing those things. So five GCSEs is perfectly reasonable. Reasonable. It's what would equip you very nicely for jobs and things like that. And then you could legitimately have that time off to have a life and watch movies and maybe not make babies <laughs> experience <so soon>, but... <laughs> the world um so yeah then i ended up having uh four children in under five years so ethan was four and a half when we had eva um and eva's now at big school because she's 12 in january um and um i'm gray because i've got four kids and i had four kids before i was 25 <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that's even more impressive than me i did have three under three and a half mm. and i am gray but i dye it but <laughs> <laughs> that's not a masking technique is it <laughs> <laughs> i'm good at the masking i was very good for many years um so what were you doing before you got into education so you were doing some geography type stuff or yeah no talk... not at all um <laughs> okay like like I'm you, a member I, of the Royal um, Society, but not actually. <laughs> I met, um, and well, I met my husband, ex husband, yeah. when I was 15, and um, he was nine years older than me at the time. And I, so I did, after I did my GCSEs, my A levels, um, which I did do very well in because my. ADHD way of dealing with things is to not pay attention, not pay attention, go, ah, get really, really stressed, lose lots of weight, be really bad to myself and come out with A's, um, which then makes everybody very, very proud of me. And then, you know, fuels that imposter syndrome of not quite sure of how it happened or whether I can repeat it. And now I'm going to have to repeat it next time. And just all of that. I went to university um, at Exeter to start with. And uh, while conducting this long distance relationship with uh, my boyfriend uh, who was in Sydney at the time, saving all my money to go out there and visit. And then I think also, like you said, the ADHD thing about having short attention spans. So I kind of then realized that it was sort of a two year thing. So GCSEs were kind of fine. That was two years and then needed something else. Okay, A-levels work. I transferred from Exeter to Southampton um, after a year, just board because <laughs> probably the people sheep ratio was just and I moved back home to save all my money so that I could emigrate and so went to Australia at 21 on a visa that was allowed me to work uh, for three month periods um, and luckily got a job in an internet media startup company with uh, a boss who was willing to take that risk on somebody who didn't really have a visa and that he could pay not so much money <laughs> to and also then allowed me to 
use all of those traits of I'm going to work so, so, so hard and I'm going to prove myself. And so ended up uh, as chief operations officer of this <laughs> startup company and really working out processes and using uh, open source technology to make this small company appear bigger than it was. I was organizing events for um, C-level executives to fly in around the country and meet up with journalists and it was absolutely wonderful really high adrenaline and brilliant uh i then moved from there to work at ernst and young and in their learning and development team and even though my salary tripled because i was then in a proper a proper job <laughs> i was doing like nothing really in terms of coordinating um so I got bored after six months, applied for a promotion to a new department, which was DNI. and It was like very flashback then. Every, you know, we need a DNI team. So they put four of us women in charge of this DNI team as partner and ED, uh, senior manager, and then me. And it really, really was so uh, confronting about how this was just paying lip service to something that they didn't really fundamentally want to put any effort into. And I found it really hard to watch um, the partner who I respected hugely, who had uh, a child with autism, who took a lot of her attention away from, or just meant that she was working all hours and really stretched, to watch her be broken down to tears by these board meetings where they would kind of laugh at what we were doing and trying to implement flexible working and um, looking at, at gender equality in the organization. So I think I managed to be, you know, on the team that rewrote some of the maternity legislation in it, which extended what they paid. And then I was married and pregnant and pretty much benefited left. from the new policy <laughs> yeah I did I did benefit from the new policy and then ended up following my ex around the world with his job so um homeschooling and home educating my children in different places we were in America for a while in California and I'm originally from South Africa and I just I, I really valued the ability to be able to travel around with them it was very clear quite early on that my eldest had ADHD as well. I was very embarrassed, nervous, um, uh, believing about having that as a label for him. I just, I really didn't want it at all. And I, I did everything to kind of change the environment, make that better to not allow those kind of symptoms to, <laughs> kind of come out couldn't go to shopping malls with him he would never sit still it was like always a huge battle and on top of that my relationship was abusive and so I then was masking and hiding all of that and keeping up all of the good appearances around that so it was very difficult but also very easy to do because we were moving around a lot and when you don't quite have the time to be in a place long enough then that works out quite well and I was away from my family and I think because of all of those things it took me a very long time to really understand what my own neurodiversity was and why that heightened everything and why to me it validated the abuse that I was experiencing as well, because I fundamentally believed that there was something wrong with me, that I that I was broken in some way. And so I was always trying to be better. I read every book about, <laughs> about parenting, about how to um, deal with sensitive children, like how, how to cope with that. And it did teach me a lot of coping strategies, but it was only when I was well, after I had tried to take my life, um, that I realized that I couldn't leave my children 
and that I was going to fight for a situation where I could look after them in a way where I was financially able to. Um, you know how physically debilitating it can be when you have such young children and where I was always the primary carer of them, I physically was trapped in that um in that situation and, and unable to work. And that frightened me because I think on one hand, I knew very much that my education and my grades were a ticket to freedom. Like that, I just, and, and the geography and back to Gaia and just actually this belief in, in that concept was as long as I have knowledge, because I have education, I am free. And that got me through a lot of very, very dark years. So it also fueled the passion of how can I use this to help other women get out of those kinds of situations? Because without it, you, you know, you literally are stuck in something like that. So we didn't have money for me to retrain as a teacher. My, um, X was very much against me being out in the world or communicating with anybody. Um, I was very much closed in, but he agreed to me becoming a teacher because it, that idea that a lot of people have about teachers is, oh, it's a nine to three job and you know you get holidays and it's not that you can still continue to look up because just absolute total rubbish. Wrong. But, it's all wrong. <laughs> yeah, completely. And, and, but, my plan, my cunning plan was I would get, I'd be the best geography teacher that there ever was, and I would get a job in a boarding school. And you were. <laughs> <laughs> and I would move in to a boarding school um, where my children could be educated and I would literally have a safe house to be in. And the way I got the money to retrain was I just literally one night hiding under the bed I on my phone applied for a um, teacher training scholarship and they accepted my invite. I went up to the Royal Geographical Society in London and had all these interviews and they phoned me straight afterwards and said, yes, we will give you £27,500 and uh, you can do your training. And that, I mean, that very quickly was spent because, you know, over 9,000 just for the tuition fees. And then I had to pay for my kids to be in after school clubs and things. So, and, but I did it and I got, uh, I did eventually get offered a job in my dream private school where when I was going through all of the divorce stuff and <laughs> police testimonials and all like really, hard things the headmaster said you know you can there's a place for you you can come and live here and and that's exactly when COVID hit as well and I I thought you know what this is there's something bigger than this this isn't just me and my kids that need to be free in this I I want to do something bigger and so Gaia is it's a big ambition to <laughs> to help other women never feel like that and to always feel like there is a an out and an alternative because when when you literally feel like there isn't there's a it's a very dark place to be thanks for sharing that's deep yeah but you're talking and, about it well which obviously means you've processed it <laughs> well yeah <laughs> I have or on the road I to it. I've done a lot of um therapy and and things like that and luckily been supported well through um the system I suppose you know when it really when it really gets that bad there are there are people that can help but again Having the courage to ask when you feel like a little bit it's your fault is not something that's easy. And I um, actually, because we have a mutual connection with Leanne and she shared something on LinkedIn today about gaslighting and 
it encouraged me to actually share a post and I have been sharing a lot more and have had the courage to share because of other people like her who share very vulnerable things like that because for so long I didn't and and the not sharing empowers the people who are oppressive like that and now that the school that I have we do attract kids who are very vulnerable and are in those situations um actually through a partnership school that we work with where that school takes in kids that have been excluded from every other school and um you know some of these kids are they're in gangs or they've gotten into drugs or they've been abused and made pregnant and just they can't they can't get into schools and so we work with them and the council and I realized that this I I know that I'm privileged. I know I have, you know, I had a first class education myself. I've had opportunities. I've done great things. But this leveling of us as humans, we I feel just the same as these families with what they're going through. Um, and to be able to connect them, as you say, with educators who just give them that thing of, I believe in you. Look what you can do. This is... We had one girl um, before the summer who had been prostituted out to all these men in um, the Midlands and she was really intelligent and clever, but she was making money on the side selling cannabis and just very angry at the teachers and want to go into her school. But she came online with us and ended up getting six GCSEs over the summer she got the highest grade of anybody who um went to that school two of those GCSEs we taught we taught her we allowed her to have access to within six weeks she taught herself RE and statistics that she did very well in that and she now wants to go on to be a lawyer to help other kids not get in that situation but it's you know it's that one spark parent that or parent one adult that believes in you one uh, and annoyingly those GCSEs whatever they are and she got fours fives and sixes but it's your ticket to freedom and a breaking of a cycle and yeah so having the courage to talk about it now I realize and I get lots of lovely messages from people who do say like it's important to talk and if I'd had seen somebody else talk and and also it's the demographic and who you identify with as well because for me being a middle class white woman in actually a very affluent neighborhood and I've got you know I I pro masked and <laughs> projected a very happy good life so it was very hard for someone as stubborn as me to go, do you know what? This isn't real. Um, so, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity as well on another platform. If just one person hears that, do you know what? There's, there is help. And for me, it was a doctor who uh, recognised what was happening. I'd gotten to a stage, I think, where... I couldn't control anything in my life. So the one thing I could was food. So I'd stopped eating, <laughs> but to the point where I was making myself very, very, very ill. And my partner took me to the doctor because work wouldn't let me go in until I'd gone to see a doctor. And the doctor phoned me afterwards and said, are you alone? I need you to write down this number. And she gave me a number of a... Um, a domestic abuse charity to get me out and once that kind of kicked in there was a whole lot of coordinated support that could help me and but it's frightening and once you make that decision you really need to know who can help so the other thing that we you know recognize on the platform so our content is on a um, an LMS but it's a an app a one one stop shop app called Flexi School, and yes, people come to us for Cambridge accredited maths and English and science and blah blah. blah. But 
sometimes they need to access something else first yeah. and whether that's support for children who are in a very stressed stage and can't be doing math tuition just yet they need some support or whether it's actually the parent going you know what I'm trying to do all of this myself and I'm very overwhelmed and how can I how can I take feel... a breath for myself yeah yeah no I, I'm um, starting to do some work with a lovely lady um, who has um, established is establishing we're, we're very close to launch um a non-profit for um abuse victims um and my old career uh was in um employee relations but a, a significant proportion of that was higher education institutes coming to us for our expertise in sexual misconduct to then support student student staff student issues um yeah, oh, I, I said it on one of the other podcast episodes that we've all got baggage um, and sometimes the acronyms and labels that we have make our bags more or less heavy um, and whatever we can do to lighten the load is a good thing um, and if that's providing alternative education to those people who have bounced off the system or struggling in the system, fab. Um, if that's supporting you know, mums and teachers... <laughs> then then that that's all good work and but it can be hard yeah. when you do accept or you you out yourself with a label just like my fears around you know accepting it for my son yeah. those are valid fears because even for me and like culturally where i come from in south africa that divorce as a you will be socially and economically ruined or yeah having a neurodiverse oh, label yes yeah is a oh yeah okay but just don't like uh, don't mention it on linkedin or don't because will someone else employ you or will you you know the the first school i worked in it was dreadful that i went through a divorce it because it was an incredibly religious school like that and so to take off a wedding ring and all that was not desirable and like to think that we still live in that with those things we say we don't and there's a lot of talk about it but actually when you talk to a lot of people their lived experiences and the results of them yep. being different do result in quite catastrophic consequences and then to try to lead from and talk about those things you're in a very vulnerable place. <laughs> and now, I mean, with startup companies, like my experience all those years ago, and very much now with two startups, looking for investment is big and scary and expensive. And I've put every personal asset that I have on the line because I believe so fundamentally in it. And while I'd love it to be a charity and ultimately with scale, it will be free to be respected in an industry you've got to charge high prices and you've got to be exclusive and you've got to be all these things as well so it's hard <laughs> I, I i yes <laughs> <laughs> you're you're in this too right <laughs> yeah um But talking to a friend yesterday, actually, who has been my best friend since I moved to the UK nine years ago. And the reason we became friends was because my well, my son really struggled to make friends as a kid. It was just always very hard. Go to all those soft play centers and he'd just like attack all the other kids. And it's always just a big, horrible nightmare. But her son, who also probably... Very much ASD. I think it's called playing robustly. <laughs> Is it? Like, yeah, it's like, yes, well, it's uh, my kid. I'm when I parent. was in a ball pit throwing balls at other people's faces, um, that was fun. So um, if that's being mean, then I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> but, but yeah, the fact that my 
my son finally had a friend that he yeah. got with. And and I think that's also the thing with ADHD as well, that friendships are, I kind of realise now, all my very close friendships are people who also have ADHD. And just sort of finding your tribe and finding your place and finding your people who accept you for your crazy brain and your <clears throat> different ways of dealing with things. Um, but yeah, she was just saying as well that it's, um, I don't know, being, being accepted, finding, finding a place is special and rare. And yeah, when you get it, you. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> And and it's something that I've come to realise in the last few years that my friend group is my wife, but I have a lot of acquaintances. Yeah, my network is huge. Um, you know, I, I've got like four people I know who work for Cambridge Assessment. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, you know, one of them um, is currently in charge of um, the A level um, computer science program. Um, and a whole heap of other fun stuff you know I, i've got a friend who's uh, one of the uh, mba leaders at judge business school you know that that I, I there are fantastic people who i converse with regularly but they're not the type of people that i pick up the phone at three o'clock in the morning because my house is on fire for somewhere to shelter um and, and that's something that i'm still coming to terms with i don't know if that's something because i've got young kids I don't have time to worry about my own friendship group. Give me another 10 years when they've all moved out. Well, maybe life will be different. Um, but no, it, it, it's really funny. In Graham's episode aired last week, um, he, he was talking about um, how we tend to attract each other. <laughs> um, which, yeah, is, is quite fun. And then sadly... Uh, you get into situations where you you attract each other, but you've attracted each other because of your similarities. But your similarities also wind you up. Oh yes, absolutely. and then and then you end up yeah. with very explosive relationships because, yeah. um, yeah, not all of our traits are helpful. No, and especially uh, yeah, and that friend as well with rejection sensitive dysphoria. That's a real yeah. thing, and it's very easy to very very deeply hurt, um, hurt each other, but. At the same time, I think there there are a lot of people having adult diagnoses now, and there seems to be a real buzz around this. Ha! Huh, like, okay, I'm I'm different, but that's why. And so many other people who haven't thrived or have come to blows with the traditional systems in whatever way are now founders entrepreneurs creatives um innovators and is a real i don't know rise of a creative class of difference and maybe it's not even there's so many of us maybe that it's recognizing that there's just an alternative way and that mm -hmm. all the discomfort and that fighting internally because you don't quite fit in but really, if there was another box, what would, maybe there's two streams or, or there's just mm. a mix and match or a, but it's well, not just, a right just, and wrong. Just and, another way. You're driving to Scotland where you can go up the A1 or the M1. It doesn't really matter. Or the yeah. M6, if you're that <laughs> way inclined. Um, so, so you know, there, 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 there are many different ways to progress. Um and you know standing still isn't standing still it's going backwards because the world's changing so fast mm. you know, what got you here won't keep up with where you are needing to be wanting to be developing to be yeah no exactly and that's really hard for people with adhd as well because especially i find being in the tech space and it's new shiny things yes that that that, 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 that. and it's hard to just in and keep it yeah, well and, and that's what i love about what i'm doing now is that i can be that butterfly Ooh, the moth to the bright light <laughs> um you know I, I i i'm not held to any standard other than my own 
I'm not held to any standard other than my wife's. <laughs> um and you know it i really need to focus on studying for this course yeah but right now i just don't have the energy to sit in front of a computer and research behavioral psychology of change <laughs> what i actually want to do is you know go watch a video or you know, do something creative with my time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then my lecturer uh, gives me a collar rub because I haven't done my assignments on time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but when you're ready to and you really want to and there's a need to, then... Well, well uh, and, and that's kind of the benefit and challenge. So, so I'm doing my level five diploma in coaching and mentoring um, to have the piece of paper to back up my skills um and i'm doing that one on one so so there's a local um facilitator of the island program that doesn't run cohorts so she's like i'll walk you through the program you can do your assessments we'll get you signed off which is fab jane is awesome um but because it isn't a cohort with a structure i don't have the deadline okay so instead of going richard i need you to complete this 3000 word assignment by the 16th of december I'm like, okay, I'll do an hour. And doing an hour is actually just researching an hour, not even writing an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then you realise that, yeah, you know, across the three assignments, it's something like 300 hours worth of effort. Oh, 300 hours? Hang on, that's 10 full-time weeks. Hang on a minute. <laughs> that's oh. that's not a lot. That, that's not a small amount of work. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, um, yeah it, it, it's starting to dawn on me that I've, bitten off lots and now i'm trying to slowly step back away from everything that i've bitten off so i wrote to a, another online learning provider and said um can i cancel and they're like well, why do you want to cancel we can give you a deferment we can give you an extension we can we can we can we can and i was like because i have two full-time jobs and two other courses that i'm doing and a third isn't gonna happen so you can yeah. take money out of my bank and me not get anything from it or i can cancel and just put the 500 quid that i've wasted away um and at least have some freedom by not having this thing constantly in my inbox every day going today you should really do some work on your assignments yeah <laughs> it's just like don't shout at me i don't want to do it <laughs> but and then well, there's a conversation um... about um demand avoidance so um a big trait in asd um, yeah, if somebody tells you to do something, you yeah, do no. everything but that thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the wife's like, You should really come and help me wash up. Tell me to do that. I would have done it if you hadn't actually said that I should do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I, I cook because I like to eat. Um, my wife's not a very good cook. Um, <laughs> she openly admits it. Um, uh, and yeah. But yeah, it's where you get satisfaction and then also actually feeding people that you get the reward. Apparently, I don't like to cook very much and I take ADHD medication, which suppresses my appetite. So I don't have an appetite to cook, which is also hard. So it's like, I know this is a thing I should do, which is different. But we also with our startups now uh, with hybrid school, we're on an accelerator program, which is a bit like an MBA. And in a cohort and with next week having the deadline of well you get to pitch to a bunch of investors and it's like fine <sighs> I'll do the financial spreadsheet but I really don't want to and I still do <laughs> sit and Kirsten it sounds like you need an accountability buddy <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No. yeah well coaching I think is a, is a very helpful for me I the last two years I have worked with coaches to keep me on track and it it it's worth its weight in in gold I couldn't wouldn't have done what I have and then working with my best friend and business partner and having shared vision and shared uh experiences of children who desperately need what we have is motivation enough and I I do feel a sense of urgency of you know just knowing that if we can get the investment and the scale how many more people we can help and it's 
like I don't but then I also think that film will there ever be a time where I go yeah okay <laughs> enough will never be enough it's <laughs> so I'll oh, just 10% more <laughs> yeah but I think trying to just balance it a bit more with spending time with the kids and going for a run and 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 recognizing that all of that time with friends or balancing is equal to everything else so so one question I, I normally ask early and we're quite deep in the conversation now what led you to getting diagnosed so late um i i always thought i was creating the school to help my son and um i this that the friend that i told you about whose son my son is friends with she'd always say to me have you ever considered you've got ADHD but it was always a bit more of a like a loving joke <laughs> but like, when you got I... ADHD no shit <laughs> <laughs> I know and then actually since I've had the diagnosis like I've had uni friends go yeah did you just figure that out now um, <laughs> take but, you a minute <laughs> yeah but it was to burnout just reaching burnout again you know and so in April this year I just got to uh, just another set it was second time having COVID very in quite quick succession um all through the the lockdowns and then all of that being very much fully responsible for my kids and setting up businesses and all of that obviously would have probably been quite tiring anyway but I actually got to a point where I phoned my brother who lives in London like midnight one night and I just said that like white flag please I like help and he drove down in the middle of the night and I think I just went to bed and I didn't wake up for 48 hours and he had tidied my house, organised my cupboards, booked me in a cleaner, um, you know, looked after the kids and he just said, do you know what, I'm going to pay for you to have an assessment. And he did, he, did, he paid for the full assessment of his own. I don't know what it is that's wrong with you, but something, something not quite right. So I'm not saying you're broken. But we're going to see if you're broken. Broken, yes. <laughs> like, let's see. Let's just see how broken you actually are. And I, yeah, I guess I hadn't been taking very good care of myself, or I, I didn't feel deserving of having that sort of self care. And so it is expensive to have the assessments done. And so it was, he did, it was wonderful that he did pay for that. But it's been a huge investment since, I think, since the, the initial diagnosis which was great and very quickly and clearly that was what it was and he said this isn't just a moderate thing this is a severe thing for you um and it took quite a while to accept it actually and and also that boundary of is this I always thought that those symptoms were part of complex P PTSD and trauma and other stuff and so it's kind of hard to go well where where is it but then looking all the way back to it's all ingredients into soup um yeah. and and they, then you realize that the potatoes dissolve and create other stodge um yeah yeah I, I i i was having a conversation with Catherine, the co-founder of the organization i just left on her episode of the podcast looking at um the theory that um adhd is trauma-based mm. um because it's really hard to uncouple mm -hmm. trauma, grief, and loss from ADHD. Yeah. Because nearly everything you do is well. So, so I've been brought up of the school of Rogers and Jungian behavioral psychology. So everything I do is basic human needs driven. Um. So then you get into that whole conversation of well, you've you you experienced trauma but how much of that time and place did you contribute to mm -hmm. and did you meaningfully contribute to it consciously or yeah. did you find yourself there because of a you know uh, a series of unfortunate events <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and it's uh, when those unfortunate events become sort of patterns in your life that yeah. I think that is where you look back and go all up. And then having a diagnosis comes with it, the responsibility to go, okay, I now need to know what my triggers are and my things are, which I think is a much longer term process and understanding and joined up thing that isn't just solved with medication. And But it's hard. And I think yeah. this year, and even like been a bit kind of emotional the last week, just Christmas and setting up trees and things like that, because it forces you to look back at that, a bit of that journey and to recognize that there have been the highest highs but it's been like it's a hard journey to yeah. <laughs> to go on and and it's yeah it's, I think part of the sharing of the story is that there are for me I've recognized there are lots of other people that are also on it and that not everybody needs to understand what it is or and and that can be quite hard in terms of close family as well because some that's hard <laughs> um so extending the tribe or finding the people that accept and un, like truly understand that bit is helpful especially if you've got people in the family that are Resistant is the word that's coming to mind, but mm. or they're not believing, less or the than thing supportive. Of... Yeah, you haven't got that. Mm. Okay, I don't. But um, your grandson, my nephew, was diagnosed at like three. So, yeah, there is a component of this that is genetic and hereditary, mm. and he has it. And you know for a fact he has it. Yeah. So you don't think that there's even a smidge, a little smidge chance that um, I might? Okay, well, yeah, you, you, yeah, maybe. Well, and you know it's hereditary, mum and dad. So you don't <laughs> yes, think that so any of your behaviours, like um, all of the stuff that you did growing up, or only working in one place for 48 years because it was comfortable for you and you had a regime and 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 mm. the hobbies that you had and the friends that you had and none of that no that's just i have a sheltered life you have a, okay mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and that whole conversation of self-awareness and um yeah. you know that there are a lot of very enlightened people and you know i'm a working class lad done well you know my mum and dad were factory and retail workers their entire lives um and some people in the lower socioeconomic groups just don't have the brain space and time to worry about all of this soft gushy stuff <laughs> self-actualization yeah. is a bit of a yeah it's a pri privilege to have that time space insight money to diagnoses medication or absolutely recognize it and i just think now like for my kids being able to show them and I I pretty much imagine that all kids are going to look at their parents and go yeah well what did you do wrong and <laughs> like all this trauma that um, my poor kids are going to have to get over because of <laughs> but um I hope that just the self-awareness mm -hmm. and doing that in front of them and being I remember like family members going well you're not going to tell your kids that you've got that are you and stuff but my kids know and they know <laughs> Well, we leave the house and they're like, yeah, your keys and your glasses, mum. Come on, let's go. Well, at least they're organised. I go to leave the house and the kids are like, I don't know where my coat is. I can only find one shoe. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. well, that'll do. I know. Well, I think, but also my kids have had to become very independent and resilient because it's just us and we've had to figure it out. And it's just, it, well, yeah. I, 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 I get that. And my, gr so I grew up with my grandparents. Let's not get into the conversation of how and why that happened. Um, <laughs> but because of that, they were of a generation where you, you had to look after yourself. So I was very independent. You know, at the age of eight or 10, I could go on a two hour bike ride and nobody would care. Or, you know, they wouldn't worry. That's probably a better way of putting it. Um, 
so you know the reason i'm as put together as i am is because i've had my life of having to do it for myself mm-hmm. um as yeah my my kids are quite sheltered <laughs> i don't know if that's a good thing well i think we yeah we do different <laughs> things and we do what we can we do what we have the capacity to do and we do the best we know how to do with what we've got at the time and I berate myself a lot for like not feeling good enough or doing well enough but yeah I hope in the end they just feel like we were enough yeah well they were loved and safe and that yeah all of the my work and distraction and obsession with growing businesses and helping other kids online is I don't know something that will be good for them too so um um a a documentary film on amazon love parentheses d loved um is um the filming of the first retreat called the bridge which was designed to bring together uh spiritualism ritualism um and science into Mm -hmm. psychology to heal wounding Wow. Um, so I went on the retreat in 2019. The film was done before that, was, but was released December 19 or early 2020. Um, and, you know, my retreat, was, there was 12 or 14 of us, six days um, near Froome. So, so a lovely bit of the mm-hmm. world. No tech, no caffeine, no refined sugar, no alcohol. Um, to to have these that time to process that time to understand your place in the world um, and my biggest takeaway from that is that it doesn't matter how you parent your kids we're all a little bit effed up and you know I'm, I'm sitting there with 13 other people and you know that there's some that have felt so controlled by their parents because oh, you know, I was a really high achiever I went to the best schools possible you know, I always had my homework done on time, but I could never go around my friend's house <laughs> or, you know, all of this stuff all the way to you know the, the other end of the scale. And I'm towards that other end, but not as deep off the other end where, you know, abuse was allowed. You know, it's just horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Um, but, you know, even if you think that you're doing your the best by your child, your child will find something to hold you on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Until they have their own, probably, and then they go, oh, do you know what? This is quite a hard gig, and yeah, maybe well, you're all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so then I saw another short recently that was said, no, they say that if you have an easy child, you'll pay for it in their teens. Oh, yeah. Um, I know. I'm working it round, but then don't have three or four kids because they'll all swap and take turns. So I feel like I've got out of hard patches and I'm in a nice teenage bit. But actually, the other one's coming up and they were good. But now they're going to be <laughs> challenging. Yeah. So um, Ramesh Ranganathan back in like 2011 came out with a lovely bit about kids. Um, and he was like, you know, my firstborn, I absolutely love him. He's awesome. My secondborn, yeah, he's a terrorist. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, Oliver, my second uh, got into the terrible twos um, and now he's 15 so um, yeah 13 years of the terrible twos <laughs> and and that of course isn't anything related to neurodiversity because we haven't had him tested why haven't we had him tested well because we're supporting him to be who he is you know, he's got a friend group he's got three or four close mates um, you know he's not as um outwardly violent as he used to be <laughs> yeah, he's calmed down a little bit um and now he plays computer games and ranges at strangers instead of throwing <laughs> tables across the nursery so you know he's he, he's it's come off a very long way um yeah. but you know it, it, just, just just like you and your son I'd, I'd rather not have the diagnosis to then have a label to give him yeah um, Whereas actually now with all the knowledge about it, my son came to me and he said, I've done the research on this. I know that this is what I have. Um, please, can I have 
whatever. My thing about it was about the medication. I wanted to be able to try that first before thinking about that. And I'm still currently of the opinion I don't <laughs> <So> want. <laughs> these are my bills. You're not. Yeah, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> mummy bills. That's mummy juice. That's another thing. Gin. Hurrah for gin. But um, it's, 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 my doctor said one glass a day. but uh, if you can change or adapt the environment to suit um my son's in a good place now with the amount of rugby that he does and he's fallen in love or something which is a good distraction and moderator of behavior which i'll take this chapter um (laughs) and how old is he now 13 so yeah things are I don't know just can't too scared to say good had a good week this week's been good this week we haven't punched any holes in walls or refused to go to school or you know it all becomes quite relative of what what a good week and period of time you scraped your plate in the bin not on it (laughs) I know I'm really grateful my son also has OCD so he's incredibly neat tidy everything's got to be just right which comes with its own other issues of oh if the smells are not quite right in the room or something it can be disastrous but but yes we we live in land and I think if we can share and laugh about it and just not feel alone I think that's what's fundamentally changed my life and and given me the courage to just keep going with it because yeah, maybe that's just what it's all about. <laughs> life needs life to live. <laughs> yeah, what other cool quote can we come up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm a big fan of um, obscure quotes from movie and theatre and stuff. Well, you watched um, a lot. I I, do. I don't, on the other hand. I can't sit still long enough to actually watch a film. Well, so, so, I don't. So, so, so this is, so, so I um, commission paint and model stuff um so so while i'm doing that um these get bored so um i listen to uh, all kinds of stuff so so yesterday i had two hours of brown noise because i was trying to focus on writing an assignment and i was like i can't i can't not listen to anything because then i'll just hear Uh, the wife hoovering and tidying and stuff and that will bug me. that's a good sound no well (laughs) the kettle going (laughs) um and but th- that whole conversation comes back to there's a group of voice actors that play Dungeons and Dragons and film it. Um, and and I've been watching them for ten years now. It it's been a while. <laughs> um, and yeah, one of the characters um, is a healer um, who um, isn't very smart but is very wise, um, and you know. Life needs life to live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got into the conversation of all of that, um, but you know, it, it's I'm also a mental health first aider. Um, I, I you know I did that training during COVID. Yes, I was in here. So 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 I've had this office for well, it's a brick outhouse. I've made it much nicer now than it was. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember sitting over there against the wall um on a zoom doing my mental first aid course but yeah it's a lot yeah yeah and it's a big responsibility those things when you start to sort of play in the space of mental health and abuse and neurodiversity it's a huge I feel it's a huge responsibility and um and yeah lying awake at night wondering about the kid who didn't show up for their online class or what but knowing also that you're the last point of contact that this kid is wanting to have with any kind of adult make you know but it but it's hard and having joined up sort of support services as well that yeah Uh, and really that framing of knowing that you can give support if somebody needs support but not necessarily being responsible for giving the support. Um, so, you know, I did the training in my previous organization because we were dealing with workplace conflict 
and trauma around bullying and harassment discrimination at work. So it was helpful for us to go through that um, knowledge and upskilling. So when we're on the phone with a party who is distraught because their life is falling around apart them because something's happened at work, then you know you have algae to walk them through. You have a book this thick of all of the different um, support groups by you know, alcoholism and substance abuse and yeah. suicide prevention and all of that other stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it it was it, it, it has been helpful. Um, have I used it? No, but I know that my algae little fold out chart. I I know where that is. So if I yeah. need to use it, I know, I know where it is. Yeah, um, and there are some amazing organisations that really do help. I know, like for me, there was an organisation called Splits, and they're local and they're a charity. And I'm pretty young like not sure if I would still be around like without them so the fact that someone could signpost me there and get it connected at the right time literally like life saving so yeah having having joined up approaches where people can get you that information at the right time in the right format where you know you can access it and also that they've got space a lot of these things are like wait list huge dependent and that can be really frustrating because when you get to a, a place where you decide okay I'm going to take the mask off a little bit because look help me help me that's really scary and then you need oh, can, help really can, like can, can you take a number <laughs> we'll yeah. see you in six weeks yeah <laughs> or, or longer. longer like much yeah. longer I mean like my son's been on a wait list for like anger management course thing for months and months <laughs> it's like okay what was the one before and so, so is, is that an nhs provision or is that externally and uh, no, that's been through his, his school and it's okay. been again through the that split support who yep. helped me and then they, they help the whole family but they also help abusers and it, like people who want to make change and it's it really and for me it comes right back down to the education when we were at school nobody taught us about relationships nobody told me at 15 that maybe it wasn't the greatest idea to be with the only person you've ever been with and not know and then not talk about things and what was happening so yeah I think like relationship advice and it's not just the biology of yeah how babies are made it's we're two good relationship each other very much <laughs> <laughs> but we don't we don't teach that so of course we're going to have these problems and knock on effects later on. And, you know, for me, I think online learning has the potential to get courses like that into the hands of more people, more families where they can do that in a safe space in their own time um, at their own pace where, you know, you don't have to sort of out yourself. Um, you know, I used to drive into back of churches or, AA meeting yeah. things and be too scared to go in but I was like it's just because if you go well then everyone's going to know that that's I'm in a pickle and so yeah online online safety nets yeah. oh. I'm not disagreeing um I, 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 I'm, I'm I'm thinking um again because you know, I'm I'm a trustee of an arms house that supports um, elderly folk to have social housing. Okay. Um, and then you get into these same con types of conversations. Well, half of those residents don't have the internet. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, it, it, it's like going back to the early '90s and the '80s. Okay, well, you had Samaritans and you could call, or Childline, or Bernardos. So you're expecting a child to borrow a phone, hide in the cupboard, and, and call for help. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is, but it's not it's not as productive or useful as it could or should be. But um... no. but I think that there is potential to um put resources like that in places where they're needed. Like in my situation I did nearly end up in a woman's refuge and then the thought of going like I don't have time to fall apart and I don't have time to do this and I spent 
months and months and months just crying in front of my kids, which I wish I hadn't had to do because that was obviously is going to have been traumatizing for them. But to be what I hope for Gaia and um, Gaia Learning and our, our team is that we can put these laptops into places like that so that women can cry for a while and their children can just access the education, carry on and and do that. But you're right, there are situations where it's dangerous to even show that you've accessed or tried to access some of these things. And um, that's why I think physical schools, there is still a place, an important place for physical school buildings and things. Um, in very recently, my children, when visiting their dad, had a very dreadful experience um, which they disclosed at school to trusted members of staff because they didn't want me to know or be worried about what had happened to them, that it was so severe that police were involved and social service, everybody suddenly came out to help them. And it really gave me confidence that there is safety in those yep. systems, those physical spaces that like, yeah, are massively needed and and important. So it's more about empowering kids to know that they have a voice and that yep. there are trusted people that they can. Well, and, and and sadly, you then sometimes end up with the other end of the scale where you have overzealous support. So so I yes. I, I, I had a um an, I had an email from my secondary my, my children's secondary school recently um because apparently my daughter stayed up all night to do her maths homework oh right yeah <laughs> can you, you abuse a parent you can, can you can you tell me exactly what you told your teacher well well I, I i i did my maths homework and it was dark and it was late and then i went to bed okay, yeah. it's what dark time? at 4 30 now <laughs> what, what time did you go to bed oh, about nine o'clock okay well that wasn't Pulling an all-nighter. <laughs> so trying to explain to the school that uh, we go to bed at like 10 or 11 and the kids are all in bed when we go to bed. You know, <laughs> there, there's six of us in a three-bed house. Trust we know. Me, <laughs> if somebody yawns, we know. You know the, the bathroom is the other side of our wall. You know, it, it, <laughs> just nobody, nobody breathes in our house without us knowing that there's something going on. So, yeah, I find it very hard to believe that she was up all night <laughs> because if she was up all night, we would have heard her go, oh, uh, or scribbling paper or watching YouTube videos, which we have caught <laughs> Doing a, a couple of times at, you know, one o'clock in the morning going, are you actually still awake? Um, sometimes, yes. Because, um, oh, you know, sleep issues is another neurodiverse trait, isn't it? Oh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, weighted blankets I found have been a saviour in my house for that. Certainly helping. Well, so, so I, 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 I'm tempted to. So, so, so we've resorted to two duvets, and then you end up with a whole duvet on you, right? So, so, so we start off with like two, and then during the night they do oh, okay. that, and then you end up yeah, anyway, um, yeah. I work. highly recommend the weighted blanket. It's um, yeah, what well, certainly helped my son a lot. But but but, but it, it is 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 that part of that conversation around um, learned behaviours? And when you were swaddled as a child, you calm down. Okay, well, the weighted blanket is essentially swaddling mm -hmm. you. Therefore, it triggers that bit in your brain to go, "You're safe. You don't need to just yeah. chill." Well, yeah, my son wouldn't be swaddled. He was always like, but it is, it's just yeah. that I, well, my brain will not turn off. I'm busy, 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 busy. Can't get up, down, up, down, up, down. And so it just actually, and for him, even still now, it's it quite like you to just sit there with him until he actually falls asleep. But it just, no. So, so just, yeah, having a little bit more of a, okay, I'm comfortable now and I'm tucked in. And that reassuring thing. Anything, it's worth a try, right? <laughs> anything try anything once my motto <laughs> but no you have to try it twice because <laughs> you don't know if you like might it once. Oh. yeah yeah um and you know yeah. that's why i now eat mushrooms again and why i now eat scrambled egg again 
well done. In my, in my youth, I was traumatized, and <laughs> now I'm trying to reintroduce all of those foods. Well, I still can't get over oysters. Oysters are the best. I'm quite partial to an oyster. <laughs> no, no, it's the no. The consistency is all wrong. We went on holiday to Scotland um, this August, and um, um, the first day there was the first. Those are big one. ones, though. Too. No, they, they were. They were. Yeah, chunky. Um, but um, you've probably seen the Lock Fine chain restaurants. Mm -hmm. We went to a restaurant on Lock Fine. Oh wow! Um, and then my eldest. So we got a seafood platter, a charcuterie board, and stuff for starter. And um, yeah, I was like, have an oyster. No, just just like put it in, swallow it. Put it in, chew it and swallow it. <laughs> That's on you. Let's go. Let's go. No. So, so, so you put it in and he was like... <laughs> I was like, well, at least you try. Like swallowing a cold or something. Yeah. D <laughs> just It's just all a little bit wrong. Oh, I don't know. Well, I used to go on holiday in Nisner and then obviously lived in Sydney. So those kind of Nisner oysters and Sydney rock oysters and a bit spoilt for... Anyway, oysters. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, we've been talking a lot. Yeah, um, I know. Very quickly. Really teach them kids. <laughs> um, is there anything that you would say about neurodiversity and the impact it's had on your life in the last five or ten minutes of us having a chat? Um, for me, where I'm at right now, I really believe work is such a big part of uh, is that who we are it can be rather than what we do and it it deserves to have a happy central good part of our existence right I, I think and I unapologetically want to work with people who are my friends who inspire me who I want to have memories with when I look back on my life and go oh, do you remember when or that was tricky or challenging or whatever and for me I just really really do accept that the traditional work environment is not conducive to my happiness the idea that somebody would tell me that I have to be there then and I can't leave till then and I can only eat then and um really just I doesn't doesn't sit well with me which is weird because when I work for myself, I just work all hours of all the day and I don't stop to eat. And I don't like, I wish someone would say stop working <laughs> because I don't have that off switch. Um, I can see how my family are concerned for me because they look on and go, why are you doing that? Why wouldn't you just go and work in a conventional place where they would give you child, you know, care vouchers and yeah. time off and pensions and things like that and like why on earth do you choose to live so riskily in this entrepreneurial yeah. space because it is but I understand it is very deeply part of the me that is me and mm. I do think that with more knowledge and understanding and more sharing like this of the realities of it, that we'll get better at helping each other manage that more realistically and holistically. Um, because it's that thing of once you have the diagnosis or you understand what it is that you have, it does come with the responsibility to go, okay, uh, I see where I'm going with this. I don't want to get to the point of burnout again. And and yet I know that because I have reached the bottom of the bottom, that it's quite, I feel very optimistic that I'm in a good space of knowing my limitations and my limits and the bottom limit. Um, so reinventing for me those it's either we all step outside of it and go like we need something completely different but I would love to think that there might be some crossover between yeah. the worlds and for I would 
be interested in going back into some kind of organizations that are developing things in the ed tech space and work in a more kind of conventional bit, but not five days a week and not like that, but in oh, other ways, I have a delivery, but I think that's um, a perfect time to finish. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been you, awesome Karen. having you on and, and, and hopefully um you've enjoyed the time on um, yeah thank you for the chat and for allowing me to share and hope it's helpful for somebody <laughs> absolutely and, and and that's kind of why i do it um that you know I, i'm dyslexic and i hate reading uh, i've got adhd and can't focus on anything um but i can focus when i'm I focus best when I'm having a conversation. <laughs> so, mm. you know, learning how other people have overcome their own challenges um, and seen how they've made a life of what they have um, gives me hope and direction. Um, and hopefully a listener or two can pick up something and say, well, actually, you know, I feel stuck in my job or relationship. Um, and actually there's something I can do to change that you know, is that finding you know, a hybrid working environment that means that you can work from anywhere in the world at any time of the day to do good work um or does that mean that you have to create that thing for yourself because it doesn't exist outside okay well, if you created it for yourself how and why do you do that you know what what passion are you bringing to that um because without passion you're really going to struggle to make anything work. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> my my old adage of, um, you know, I spent 20 years in commercial. And so what's the strategic plan? So do oh, stuff, yeah. make yeah. money. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> what stuff? That's a tactical plan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, no, it's but I think that's also where it comes back to the, the like the Gaia principle thing and the, that, it's that Japanese ikigai that if you're doing something that you are fundamentally passionate about and it is just coming out of your living being and if it if the world really needs it it will be self-perpetuating it yeah. will generate the money that you need it to generate for it to sustain you and that's all it needs we don't need to be billionaires or do whatever but we need to be able to create the funds to do what makes Live. us individually human yep. and enjoy yeah. our experience while we're here. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. Cool. Well, thanks very much. Pleasure. Thanks awesome. for having me. Speak soon. <laughs> Bye.